Ryan Stanton here with ASAP Frontline, joined today here ASAP 22 with Dr. Roderick Fontanet, and uh, we're talking about some of a uh, couple of his topics. We'll probably combine them. They are not related uh, related in terms of is it a seizure or a lumbar puncture. Uh, I guess they could be in some ways if you're trying to figure out why people are seizing. That's unexplained. But we're going to uh, dive into these topics here. So, you know, first and foremost, um, joining us here on the front line, give us a little background on yourself. Let let the let everybody, all the listeners know about you. Uh, so, uh, been an EM doc, uh, did uh, my residency uh, through the Air Force, uh, some prior Air Force. Actually, I just retired from the Air Force after 21 years in. Uh, became a civilian one July. Uh, so, just trying this civilian thing out for a while and uh, see how much I like it. But uh, 21 years in the Air Force, I trained at one of the Air Forces, uh, at that time, two residency programs uh, with Wright State University uh, and Wright Patterson Air Force Base in lovely Dayton, Ohio. Mm -hmm. uh, then I did uh, a med school back home in Louisiana at LSU up in Shreveport, residency in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, and then I did a two year critical care fellowship uh, at IU Health uh, at Methodist Hospital in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, and then I left fellowship uh, in 2013, uh, and I went on to work at the University of Cincinnati, again with the partnership between the Air Force uh, and UC Health, uh, to be cadre or an instructor for one of the Air Force's critical care air transport uh, courses or CSTARS courses. Uh, and then I left there after about three and a half years to uh, start uh, another partnership with UC Davis uh, here in Sacramento, California, uh, as the Air Force's Associate Program Director for a new residency mm -hmm. that the Air Force did in a partnership with UC Davis and David Grant Medical Center at Travis Air Force Base. And that's where I finished out my Air Force career as I retired, as I said, in, uh, 1 July, became a civilian. Now I'm doing my emergency medicine shifts uh, in the emergency department at UC Davis. Uh, and I do some nights in the CTICU, and I just got hired on, <clears throat> excuse me, to be the medical director of an ICU at St. Helena. That's a tough place to be right That's there. That's absolutely goodness horrible, gracious. man. Oh, I keep getting, goodness. the wine just keeps getting forced on me, and I just, yeah, I, can't, I can't do it, you know? I can't do it. All right, so we're talking seizures, and then we'll talk a little bit about the LPs. Uh, so give us kind of a breakdown, uh, the overall theme uh, of what you're with, with the idea behind seizures? Yeah, so seizure management, and more importantly, status epilepticus. Uh, the focus is, one, making sure folks know uh, what the definitions are uh, in terms of when to treat a seizure, right? And so that's one of the beginning parts I talk about in the uh, in opening of the lecture. And it's back in the day, like prior to 2004, uh, we didn't really treat seizures until they started to last like 30 minutes or so, right? Mm -hmm. So that was more than enough time to run down to like a doctor's lounge, grab some coffee and a beverage, come back. Hell, if they still seizing, then I'll treat them then, right? And so in 2004, all these societies, ASEP, Neurocritical Care Society, American Epileptic Society, they all said 30 minutes is way too long because what we learned is that the longer a patient sees, the longer a patient will seize. And so that time frame was dropped from 30 minutes to about five minutes. If that patient is still seizing in five minutes, you probably want to do something about it. And I remember even when I was a resident, uh, I was in, uh, in the PTD and uh, a little sick kiddo came in and they were seizing and still seizing and still seizing and five minutes had passed and everybody was still there kind of just watching the kiddo seize. And I'm like, what are we, are we not gonna do anything about it? It was, oh, it's, it's, it's just been five minutes. Well, uh, it, it should stop on its own. And, as we all know, right, about well over 90 plus percent of the patients that come into us via like EMS or whatever the case may be, from the field with seizures, those seizures have stopped by the time that patient has made it to us, the vast majority. But what about the ones that don't stop seizing? When should we be doing things? And per the literature and now per the guidelines, and even ASAP stands behind this, is that if that patient is still seizing within five minutes, the likelihood of them stopping on their own it's probably nil, right? So you need to become more aggressive with seizures. That's the first thing. Uh, and then status epilepticus, right? So how do you define status epilepticus, right? So in, per the guidelines, it says that if a patient has not returned back to their baseline in between seizures, then that by definition is status epilepticus. But then I think there are other definitions that we really aren't like that familiar with, like refractory status epilepticus. It's like, well, what the heck is that? So that is a patient that if I've treated them, and this is the key, with appropriately 
dosed medications. That includes your appropriately dosed benzodiazepines. That includes then picking one of your other medications, either phosphenitoin or phenytoin, whether that's valproic acid or uh, Depakote, or whether that's levetiracetam or Keppra, appropriately dosed medications. If they're still seizing after that, then that is by definition refractory status. If a patient is still seizing after I've given them my second line agent, the likelihood of them responding is probably less than 10%. That patient is still gonna go on and continue to seize. So that's why, and I think quite often, uh, and again, in residency, I experienced this as well. I think quite often we give folks like one or two milligrams of lorazepam or Ativan because that's what most of us were using our ED. As the guidelines will say, that one or two milligram dose is underdosing patients by quite a lot. The actual dose is 0.1 mg per kg of lorazepam. In most adults with a max of four milligrams, in most adults, they will meet that four milligram dose. Mm -hmm. So given that patient one milligram, studies also show that about 85, 86% of patients that we treat with that first dose of benzos is underdosed. So we're missing the mark by well over 85% of the times. And so for me, for most adults, if I'm calling for lorazepam or Ativan, I'm calling for four milligrams because most of them will meet that, that dose. Even in the pediatric population, that dose is still 0.1 mg per kg with a max of four milligrams. And so the guidelines show that we underdose folks. Well, okay, then, so let's look at our second tier agents, right? And so I've given you a dose of four milligrams of Ativan. You're still seasoned. I'm automatically, within the next two, three minutes, calling for that next dose of lorazepam. I'm gonna repeat whatever that first dose was. But while I'm calling for that second dose, I'm also calling for my second line agent because I'm trying to shorten that refractory period that's gonna take for someone and then have to go back to the Pixis, get another medication, draw that medication up, bring it back to the bedside, and then administer it. So if I'm calling for that second line agent, I'm also, and for me, I use levetiracetam, uh, not that one works better than the other. I don't know if you guys remember the, the ESET trial, the ESET trial came out. And what that trial did was it compared levetiracetam to phosphenitoin to vaproic acid. And that study showed that they all suck equally, right? So about 50% of the time they will work. Uh, the side effect profile really wasn't that different between those three medications. The key though is that you just gotta pick one and again, going back to what I said earlier, not just pick one, but pick one and appropriately dose that medication. What's our typical dose of levetiracetam that we give? We give a gram, gram and a half, right? So we can check the box that I gave it. That is, again, way under dosing that medication. If you look at that trial from ESET specifically, it said phosphiny was 20 phenytoin equivalents per kilogram. It said that folic acid was 40 mg per kg, and levetiracetam was 60 mg per kg with a max dose of four and a half grams. When was the last time you gave anybody four and a half grams of Keppra? Oh, never. Exactly, right? Yeah. And so quite often, and even when you call for that big dose, right, even the patient wakes up and says, that's a lot of Keppra that you're about to give me, right? But that is the actual dose that they did in that article. And so for me, if I'm calling for, for levetiracetam, I'm calling for about four and a half grams that based off of 60 mg per kg. And for most of the patients that we dose in our EDs across America, that's going to be pretty close to that four to four and a half gram max. But again, it's appropriately dosing those medications. And then if that doesn't work, what to do next? Because now this patient is transitioning to this space to where it is going to be really, 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 really difficult to stop this seizure. So if, I'm, if I've given you that two doses of benzos and you're still seizing, I'm giving you now that whatever your second light agent is, either phosphine, vaproic acid, or levetiracetam, and you're still seizing, now I'm calling for RSI medications because I'm about to have to control your airway and probably just deep dive you and sedate you in hopes of stopping you from seizing. There are other options that we can use. One of my personal favorites uh, is ketamine. Uh, and the question is, why ketamine? Well, one, because I love ketamine. Uh, not personally, but for my patients, right? But I love ketamine because ketamine is kind of like a lot of stuff kind of rolled into one which makes it such a great drug. And so what the literature kind of shows is that the longer a patient sees, uh, sees as their GABA receptors begin to internalize, right? And a NMDA receptors, which are very sensitive to glutamate, which is an excitotoxic agent, right? Those receptors begin to upregulate and present themselves more on the cell surface. So I need to give them something that's gonna target their NMDA receptors. Well, just so happen we have a medication that does that, and that's ketamine. So, I hit you with benzo times one, hit you with benzo again times two, you're still seizing, I load you again with another agent, and then I'm possibly looking for ketamine 
as my potential RSI medication. So instead of doing something like rock and automate or sucks and automate, I may reach for a sucks a ketamine or rock and ketamine because I think that I want to target these different receptors. Even propofol uh, is a GABA A agent, right? So it kind of does the exact same thing that the benzos do. Uh, but as I just told you, that the longer this patient is seizing, those GABA receptors aren't that robust on the cell surface. So I think at that time, we probably need to look at transitioning to doing something a little bit more focus and that that could potentially be what ketamine helps. So what you're seeing is in kind of the moral of the story is that um, our main issue is we tend to be underdosing our right. medications and treatments. Um, we need to be patient but not too patient before right. we start kicking in. Um, and is there, is our medications seem to be pretty consistent, have not, not a ton has changed other than, you know, getting the right dosing. Uh, anything else that pitfalls, tips and takeaways uh, with regard to seizure status treatment? Yes, uh, so one thing that I learned uh, that I don't know if a lot of us truly appreciate is that post-ROSC patient, mm -hmm. right? So studies show that about 24-ish percent of patients that come in post-ROSC that are still comatose are non-convulsant status. And that's a problem, right? And some literature even says almost as high as 30% of patients that are post-ROSC comatose are actually having subclinical seizures. And so I think that's something that, as a group, we need to recognize a little bit more. Because that patient could be, especially like in some of these small, like rural or community hospitals, this patient could be sitting in the ED on a Friday night, came in, post ross went minimum upstairs to the ICU, was quite often in some of these smaller hospitals, we're managing the ED and the ICU, right? So it may not be a while, it may be a while before someone actually sees that patient. Mm -hmm. The question is, do a lot of these small hospitals have EEG capability on the weekends? Because Neurocritical Care Society strongly recommends that these patients get put on uh, continuous EEG. And, and there have been studies that show that even a 60-minute spot EEG will still miss upwards of 50% of patients that are in subclinical status. So recommendations are at least two hours, uh, maybe even 24 hours of continuous EEG to make sure you're not missing seizures. So think about it, right? So you have a patient that came in post ROS to the ED. You get this patient admitted. Everyone on the team did an amazing job of resuscitating this patient, getting this patient back. You admit them upstairs for targeted temperature management, whatever your views are on targeted temperature management these days, but you get the patient plugged in upstairs, right, preventing a fever, and this patient doesn't get connected on EEG, right? So Monday comes, uh, say 72 hours late, later when you're trying to neuroprognosticate this patient. Quite often a part of that process hopefully is EEG. Mm -hmm. You get this patient connected to EEG and they're seizing. The question is, how long has this patient been seizing for? I don't know. Right? And so that's why Neurocritical Care Society and some of these other societies are recommending, and even when I was in fellowship, almost 100% of the patients that we did TTM on got put on continuous EEG for this very reason, so you don't miss seizures. I was deployed in Germany last year, right? And so that was a 40-something-year-old male, uh, active duty, uh, was running uh, just around the perimeter on the inside of the gate of the base and collapsed, went into cardiac arrest. So this patient got resuscitated, got revived, got admitted to the ICU at the hospital there, and then they were calling our team to potentially transport this patient, right? Because that's one of the Air Force's, uh, what we call critical care air transport teams, or CCAT teams. It's basically a flying ICU at 30 to 35,000 feet in the air. So someone has to be able to get these patients from Germany back to the United States. Mm -hmm. And so they called on my team. So it's like, hey, we're gonna need this person to be transported. I said, okay, so what's going on? They told me about the cardiac arrest, patients in the ICU, still unresponsive. I was like, hey, what do you guys think? Do, do you have EEG capability there? They were like, yeah, so they're gonna put him on EEG. And sure enough, put the guy on EEG, like I think it was a day after he had already been admitted to the hospital, and lo and behold, he was in non-convulsive status. And so the question again becomes, how long has this patient been seizing? And so I think that's something that we need to kind of work with our hospital leadership to say, hey, look, I'm really concerned that this patient could be having subclinical status, and the only way for me to know that is to get an EEG. And the question is, is this someone we need to admit to our hospital, or do we need to get this patient transferred out where there's EEG capability? Right. Uh, there are certain devices, uh, and again, I don't get paid by any of these people, but there are certain devices like Cerebell, right, who I think is uh, in the exhibit hall now, that has almost like a point of care uh, EEG 
And there are other companies out there as well where you can literally plop this thing onto a patient, get a quick run of uh, an EEG, and have someone potentially uh, remotely be able to read this thing and say yes or no, this patient's seizing. One of the things with Cerebell is that it's, it used to be called the brain stethoscope, right? So it would play like even an audible sound to say this patient is seizing or not seizing. And it would even give you like a seizure burden to treat anything over like 50% or whatever. So there are devices on the market that are coming out that are made for some of these smaller hospitals that don't have access to a more robust EEG uh, platform. So, but it is something I think you need to consider. Uh, other patients, for me, that I would say you'd probably need to transfer. Uh, like I had a patient when I was working in the ED, guy came in and man, he was seizing. He was seizing out in the field with EMS. They gave him meds, they got him to us in the, ED, in the emergency department, we appropriately dosed the benzos, that didn't work. More benzos, that didn't work. Moved on to our second line agent, still didn't work. So I said, date paralyzed this guy, and I finally his seizure stopped. I don't know if they just stopped because I paralyzed him, but he stopped shaking, right? So everybody was high-fiving. So I was like, this guy can't stay here. It was a Friday night. We did not have EEG capability on the weekend. So I was like, we got to transfer these guys out, right? Because by definition, at the very least, he's status. Or at least he was before I paralyzed him, right? And so I called around. Uh, they got me connected to a neuro ICU doc. I said, hey. I have a patient here, I ran through the whole story with him. I was like, and I'm concerned that his seizures probably just burned out, right? And now he's in non-convulsive status. I need to get him transferred over to a neuro ICU, to your neuro ICU, for continuous EEG monitoring. He was like, man, I don't, I don't think this guy needs to be transferred. He's like, I mean, is he, is he seizing now? And I was like, but isn't that the definition of non-convulsive status? <laughs> I'm like, I think he's transitioned to non-convulsive, but I, don't, I can't tell you that one way or the other. That's why I'm trying to initiate this transfer, right? That's the whole purpose of you and I talking. And then finally he was like, all right, fine, just transfer him. Right? And so you have to advocate for your patients, but again, you have to know the information to say these are the things that I'm concerned about, and this is why this patient needs to be transferred. Uh, in terms of what does ASEP say about like workup and CTs and MRIs, and uh, for, for me personally, and I would probably, I think non, uh, Neurocritical Care Society kind of says this as well, and ASEP kind of says the same thing also. And any patient with a first time seizure that comes to you in the ED, I probably would just go ahead and get a non con head CT on that patient. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure I'm not missing either a space occupying lesion, making sure I'm not missing a bleed, right? And patients that have subarachnoid hemorrhages, those patients have seizures. So just making sure we're not missing seeing anything, I'd probably would go ahead and just get a non-con head CT. Uh, in terms of labs on those patients, obviously all of these patients need an ACU check because it'd be poor form to do a million dollar workup to then realize on the back end that his blood glucose was 25. Yeah. I call that a fail, right? And so usually our EMS uh, colleagues and even our nurses, right, these patients come in, we don't even have to say get an ACU check, they usually just get a quick point of care ACU check. But I'd probably start there and then lights in. Uh, like everybody gets a CBC because that's just a, the interest to the emergency department. So CBC, lights, mag, FOS, and all those things to make sure we're not missing anything. Uh, to, to LP or not to LP these folks, right? Uh, I would probably say that if I'm concerned, especially if they're immunocompromised, new onset seizure, febrile, and all that, I'm probably going to LP those folks a, a thousand times over. So on those, yes, the data on that is clear. It's not so clear on those folks that I'm not really like concerned about an infectious process, head CT is negative. To LP those folks, and even Neurocritical Care Society is kind of like, well, if you're concerned about something like an intracranial infectious process, then yeah, go ahead and LP them. But you don't have to LP 100% of patients with, with new onset seizures. Uh, especially if this is someone that had a new onset seizure and they're back to baseline mental status, following neuronormal, no focal deficit, then yeah, I probably wouldn't be sticking a needle in that patient's back. Uh, I'd probably just follow them along clinically, get a head CT on them and make sure I'm not missing anything, and then kind of go from there. I would probably strongly recommend calling your local neighborhood neurologist just to make sure you kind of get them plugged in with that. Uh, and quite a few of these systems, like, man, this is an amazing thing with UC Davis. We have a tremendous uh, network of, like, case managers and social workers that can help get these folks plugged in. Uh, and I think that's a tremendous benefit to make sure you don't just release them out into the wild with a first-time seizure, but absolutely no resources and no one to follow up with. So you have to get them plugged in with neurology. Uh, and then, in fact, like, in terms of, like, imaging, right, and so those a study that came out and I think it was the American uh, Journal of like Neurology that said you may even want to consider like getting an MRI on some of these patients. Uh, and there was a study that looked at this and they found that I think like 19-ish percent of folks that had a negative non-con head CT, when they got an MRI, they actually found a lesion on the MRI that they believed to be the culprit as to why the patient seized. And so if 
you actually speak to one of your neurologists and they say, you know what? We have a captive audience, they're in the ED, they're probably gonna get lost to follow up. Just go ahead and get an MRI on them while they are there. That's probably why. It's because they wanna make sure they're absolutely not missing a potential cause or reason, like a structural lesion, as to why this patient had a seizure. Uh, so just something to consider. And I've had that, I've called a neurologist, uh, I wasn't planning on getting an MRI, called the neurologist as a consult, I said, hey, got this patient here, first time seizure. Uh, just for one, what do you want me to do in terms of meds? And two, head CT was negative. Any recommendations? He was like, yeah, I mean, I, I just recommend that you guys go ahead and get an MRI. And I was like, knowing the data, I was like, well, I can't push back because I know why he wants to get this. Mm -hmm. And so we went ahead and got the MRI. Fortunately for this patient, it was negative, but that's why. Uh, and so I know a lot of hospitals are getting like these observation units. We have one at UC Davis, uh, and so I wouldn't be surprised even if the neurologist say, hey, would you mind just putting them over in OBS uh, on the, what we call the MRI pathway to get an MRI to make sure we're absolutely not missing anything. Uh, just in case the patient does get lost to follow up, we want to be absolutely so certain we're not missing a brain lesion that we need to obviously do something else about. Uh, and so just be on the lookout for that. Particular. So you, you actually kind of talked in and almost segued us into your second topic there, you know, talking about LPs. Um, and so this isn't, we talked about LPs with regard to seizures, but we're now kind of transitioning to LPs in general as that topic. Mm -hmm. So give us a little background on, on when and where we are with lumbar punctures, because it seems like something that we're not doing near as much as we used to. Yes, yes, and the patients are happy use. about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so for my talk, so the LPs and subarachnoid hemorrhages, right, but LPs in general, uh, especially like in terms of subarachnoid hemorrhages, you're absolutely spot on. We're doing few and far between now. Uh, and the reason because of that, uh, I think, uh, is because of, uh, like a lot of the literature, right, saying, like, if you go back to, like, the Perry study, when Perry looked at to LP or not to LP, uh, and he came out with the criteria saying that if these patients present within six hours, and that's the key, right, like, you have to know when this patient's headache started. And if they present within six hours, barring like their hematocrit's fine, like over 30 or whatever the case may be, and uh, obviously any focal neuro exam, uh, focal final finding on your neuro exam, uh, that, that throws this out of the window. But, uh, and I don't think we'll be sending anyone home with a new neuro deficit yeah. anyway, right? So that's usually not even applicable to, to a lot of this. But if this patient presents within six hours of their headache onset, neural normal, they don't have like meningismas and all this other stuff, and their crit's normal, and you get a, non, a negative non-con head CT, you can effectively rule this patient out from a sudden acute subarachnoid hemorrhage and not have to go down the pathway of doing the LP. And I think that's what a lot of folks are starting to do now and starting to implement into their practice, that if you present within six hours, and then he also said that it has to be the most recent generation, like uh, CT scanners, which I think most hospitals have now. Uh, I think it's like the third generation or whatever it is, uh, uh, CT scanners, uh, and if that's normal. And then the other question that comes up too is, well, Who's reading this CT, right? Does it have to be a neuroradiologist that's reading this? And the case is, is not so much, right? So as long as, and what I try to do is, is put in like my indication for the CT as a headache, uh, acute headache, uh, evaluating for subarachnoid hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. So that way, when the radiologist, when he or she looks at this head CT, they know what my number one concern is. Uh, and that's, try, I'm trying to rule out, a rule in, I guess, uh, an acute subarachnoid hemorrhage. And so, if that CT comes back negative within the first six hours, then you can effectively rule that patient out. And the conversation comes up in terms of CT angio. That's the big one. Yeah. Right? And so what I want people to take away from my talk, uh, and actually it, it's, uh, it's an ASAP Connect uh, that we're doing. So hopefully it's very like an interactive session because this talk's been around at ASAP now for a while because it keeps going like back and forth in terms of to LP or not and when to LP. Um, and so... One of the things that we're going to touch on at our talk is, is saying that after six hours, it gets a little bit kind of gray. And the reason being is that how long does it take for xanthochromia to really develop, right, uh, or to show up in an LP? It takes almost 12 hours, right? So what happens if this patient shows up at hour seven or hour eight? It's just my luck. That's what's going to happen, right? And so the first thing I'm going to do is, is hope that it's almost time for me to sign out so I can sign that LP out to somebody else. <laughs> I have to deal with it. But if it's still very early on into my shift and I need to make a decision, you need to be able to like appreciate why you're doing these tests. Like what are you looking for on these tests? So if I'm looking for xanthochromia on an LP, then you have to know the limitation of said test, just like any other test that we do in the emergency department. So then I know that if this is hour seven or eight, it may be too soon for xanthochromia to show up in my LP. So then the question is then what do I do? What I say is I would do the LP, 
and if it's still too soon, and if I'm still concerned about this patient, then you may want to admit this patient to an observation unit like we have, and then potentially repeat your tests uh, or repeat your imaging later on, right? So after the 12-hour mark, where that LP is a little bit more sensitive. That's one thing. Next thing is, how about a CT angio? Okay, you can get a CT angio, but again, you have to know the limitations of said test. What are you looking for in that CT angio? I'm not looking for a subarachnoid hemorrhage. I'm looking for an aneurysm, right? And so just because the patient has an aneurysm, does that then mean that they have a subarachnoid hemorrhage? Not necessarily so, right? There's a the percentage of the population, like almost like 10%, I believe it is, of the population that has these asymptomatic aneurysms. Where if I CT angio enough people, I'm going to catch someone that has that aneurysm. That doesn't necessarily mean that that was the cause of their potential headache. And so now what I just did was, I put this patient into a pathway that's gonna require a lot more tests of their potentially asymptomatic aneurysm. So that's the first thing. So that could end up being more costly and predispose the patient to more tests when they really don't need those tests. So that's the first thing with CT angio. Second thing with CT angio is, is that it quite often misses aneurysms less than three millimeters. Well, we all know that an aneurysm of two millimeters can have very bad outcomes. So the test isn't the greatest for catching smaller aneurysms. So again, should you or could you use this? Yes. But again, you have to know the limitations of your test. And I go back to what I just said, if I am still concerned, like this patient is still very uncomfortable, mm -hmm. then I'm probably just gonna go ahead and get this patient admitted, serial neuro exams, follow this patient very closely, contact my local neighborhood neurosurgeon and see what he or she recommends. Uh, it could just be that, hey, repeat the CTA, or can we just go ahead and get an MRI, right? Uh, looking at some of the sequences on, on MRI, uh, like uh, SWI, GRE, some of these studies that are a little bit more sensitive to picking up blood on an MRI than a regular like DWI, or whatever the case may be. Uh, but again, that's when I start leaning on my consultants a little bit more so. But you have to understand the limitations of your tests. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Great discussions, and I hope everybody catches it out. So connect. Come to my talks. <laughs> yeah. So if you're if you're here, you're listening. You're live. Make sure you make the talks for those that are listening to this as a download uh, after ASAP 22 is over. Um, we'll see. I don't know exactly which ones are going to end up on the virtual ASAP or which ones will be available. But catching it, you know, making sure you're checking things out. Good conversations regarding. Uh, status, epilep uh, status epilepticus and seizures, as well as kind of delving a little bit into that LP. But I want to go, don't want to get too far into there because I heard you're going to do a little Imra podcasting on the yeah. LP one as well. Leave them, okay. leave them some action. <laughs> so, um, how can folks get in touch with you if they've got any more questions or thoughts or feedback? Yeah, so please feel free to sh uh, shoot me a quick email. Uh, obviously, I'm on Twitter, uh, but I'm also like my email is R F O N T E N E T T E at ucdavis.edu. And I would love to chat with anyone that wants to talk more about this stuff. I can talk about this all day long. So, so yeah, your feel free to reach out. Uh, it is a very good question. Let's see. I always forget this thing. Uh, let's see. <laughs> I know, right? It is at Rod, so R-O-D, Fontenet, F-O-N-T-E-N-E-T-T-E, -E -T -T -E, one. So at Rod Fontenet, one. All right. Please feel free to reach out. And then as for me, you can contact me at rstanton at asap.org, rstanton at asap.org, at Everyday Med on Twitter. Uh, make sure that you're subscribed to the podcast on whatever your favorite platform is, and uh, join us each week as we bring you new content. Until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASAP Frontline. If you're not on the front lines, you're on the sidelines.